All right. How you doing, guys? Thanks again for coming. Um, I suppose we'll just get started by just going down the line with everybody and just kind of getting some background on them. Oh, sorry. We'll just get a little bit of background on everybody, um, mainly just looking to know how you guys came to support your teams uh, or how you came to get involved in your supporters group or create your supporters group as it were. So we'll start with yourself there. Oh, um, I've been a Manchester City supporter since I was about five years old. Uh, I have family in Manchester and in Ireland who uh, you know, made that choice for me back in the 90s when, say, we, to put it kindly, were not that good as we are today. Um, Actually, my involvement uh, as part of the New York Sky Blues is relatively new. Um, I'm from here, but I only moved back uh, three years ago from Chicago, where I helped, where I was a founding member of the Chicago Manchester City Supporters Group. Um, and so I've only just joined uh, the steering committee of uh, our group at the Mad Hatter this year. Michael. Uh, Michael here, um, the co-founder of the New York Copites, we're uh, an um, unofficial uh, Liverpool supporters um, club here in, in New York uh, since 2008. I've uh, been supporting uh, Liverpool since I was young, my uncle made me a fan and um, basically what, you know, what we do, what makes us you know, different from any other club uh, is that we, we do have two bars here in, uh, in New York. Uh, one on 17 John Street, which is uh, uh, the Irish American, and Carragher's uh, is the second one, which is in Midtown, which I also uh, manage. So, uh, you know, for me, being a, a Liverpool supporter and, 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 and a football fan has, uh, um, you know, given me opportunity, really, you know, being, uh, being now a manager and, 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 and really, uh, you know, one of the uh, uh, initial brokers of, of making Carragher's uh, uh, what it is uh, and if you guys don't know it's uh, Carragher's is named after Jamie Carragher who you know played for Liverpool and and, and is also you know quite relevant being on on Sky Sports so uh, very uh, you know very proud of what you know what we've been able to accomplish by you know building a community here in New York of, uh, of you know expats as well as uh, you know American fans and really fans from all over the world that get to you know share the joy of watching, uh, you know, watching our favorite team. Uh, Matthias, president and founder of FC Bayern Munich soccer fan club here in New York. I uh, became a Bayern fan when I was five years old um, because Bayern back then was uh, making uh, uh, advertisement for fire trucks and I wanted to bec become a firefighter when I was five before I wanted to become a soccer player. Uh, five years ago, I started the Bayern Fan Club here in New York because I didn't want to watch uh, Bayern alone on the TV Saturday mornings in my pajamas. And I figured if I can watch the game with my friends at a bar in pajamas, that'd be even better. Uh, we uh, watch the games at Smithfield. Uh, we have 300 members. We have a nine-member board. We support our community with the South Bronx United. And uh, uh, thanks for the invitation to be here. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rox Fontaine. I'm president of the Third Rail. I am not a founder of it. I was actually founded by a gentleman named Chance Michaels. Um, I'm, I've been president for about a year and a half now, I think. Um, end of the first season, so 2015, August to present. Uh, we are about 1,000 members. I think we're at 1,050 now. Uh, we're the first and largest independent supporters group for New York City Football Club. And we watch away matches at St. Pat's Bar on 46th. Um, that's pretty much it. Our history is short, so I don't have a whole backstory like these guys. Uh, when the team was announced, I was interested. Bought season tickets a year before they played their first game. And I've been rolling with them ever since. Love it. And can't see anything else but blue. Um, Rox, while you're there, you say you have 10, 50 fans now. Um, do you know uh, what the growth rate of that has been? Because it seemed like Third Rail was it kind was, of exploded onto the scene at the beginning. Yeah, right? so year one was actually, it was up around 1,700. And then a large number of people obviously went, did other things, split into smaller groups or just left the Third Rail. Sure. Um, there's a bit of chaos in the first season, obviously, with a club being so new. Um, there were so many people pulling in so many different directions. Um, it just kind of hit a boiling point, kind of went back down to reset. 
So since that point, we've been steady at 1,000. We usually finish the year around 1,200, 1,100 to 1,200. Um, so the growth rate has actually, it was up year one, down at the end of year one, and then steady at around 1,100. Gotcha. And we're hoping to grow that over time. It's interesting because I wanted to ask the guys um, what kind of challenges they faced uh, with a supporters club that's overseas, but I guess having a domestic team comes with its own challenges too. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, there's the issue of management on, on its own, and then there's the issue of a brand new club where everything is so new to everybody, and there's no, you know, these guys, they have a club that has years of history, they have an understanding of what the team is and what is expected with our group and our fan base. There was just so much happening at the same time. And there is no history. There is no, there are no guidelines. There are no sure. rules. So all of that had to be set up at some point. So that's the kind of stage we were in year one, partial part of year two. And now it's just about, this, the foundation has been reset for the third rail. And it's just now about growth and expanding the brand. Mateus, how would that contrast to the way things work within your organization as a supporters group overseas? So the first thing that uh, I was looking for was a soccer bar that would host the supporters uh, group. And I found a great one with uh, Smithfield. They're on 25th Street. They already had a history of um, hosting supporters uh, groups with uh, Manchester United and Barcelona. Um, so with Smithfield, we found a great venue where we get to watch uh, every match and uh, we get to uh, interact with uh, fans from other clubs and it's a, it's a great community. We get to know about other leagues, about other players, uh, how other people run their fan clubs and we do get to do things together. Uh, maybe an obstacle was that the Bundesliga, most of the games are at 9.30 in the morning and that's really early for a lot of New Yorkers, Saturday morning, uh, they either come back from the bar um, or they go to the bar. Um, I guess the Premier League fans, they start early at seven o'clock coming from the bar to go to a bar, so it's easy for you guys. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we get German breakfast from the bar, we have German beer, um, you know, all the typical German stuff. Um, and Champions League uh, matches uh, during the week, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, 2.45 in the afternoon, are also well visited. Um, so it's been a, a steady growth since uh, 2012, and uh, with Germany always advancing in the World Cup or the Euro, that also helps the growth of the fan club. And would you, would you promote your fan group, or would, uh, do your members generally come to you, seek it, you out? It's a, a good question. Uh, uh, in New York or in this time, uh, everything goes through social media. So uh, I think every supporters club should make it easy for fans to find them. Mm -hmm. So you should have a Facebook uh, uh, page. You should have a Twitter account, uh, maybe a, a, a meetup uh, a group. Um, and the bar on their website also promotes uh, the matches. Um, when you walk around in the city and you see somebody with a Bayern jersey, you usually approach them and ask them, are you, do you know about the fan club? Do you want to come watch the match together with us? Um, when you're playing soccer yourself and you see somebody with a Bayern jersey, you know, all these things made it a lot easier over the last years because soccer has been such a booming sport in the United mm -hmm. States and New York um, to find uh, um, Bayern supporters here in New York and we get a lot of tourists. Mm -hmm. New York is the tourist city number one in the United States, thankfully. Germans love New York and uh, they just can't do without Bundesliga and they come to the pub Saturday morning and some great uh, friendships uh, and supporters, uh, uh, partnerships have uh, resulted from that. So um, it's, uh, soccer is really a sport that connects uh, people. Um, Michael, uh, the New York Copites are sort of newer on the scene, but their numbers have really exploded recently. Um, how's that dynamic for you, kind of being kind of the new kids on the block, but having such great infrastructure behind you as well? well yeah, I, I think um, the main reason why our, our growth has, has, has really exploded in, in the last two, three years, besides the fact that we have, you know, two great venues where uh, now this might sound uh, as an oxymoron, but we, we take pride in, in having family-friendly sports bar. 
and I think that's uh, you know that's the key to our growth. The fact that uh, you know uh, families can come in, and, and obviously with respect to Carragher's, it being near the Times Square area, we get a lot of tourists that that come to, to, to join us for on match days. You know, for example, to to your point, Liverpool play Man City at 7:30 in the morning on Saturday, and. Uh, um, we have, you know, over 80 reservations uh, already. So I think that's a, that's a testament to, to, to not only the fan base, but um, also, you know, to, you know, just a, a good venue and good customer service and, and, and people wanting to come back and, and be part of that experience. Because, uh, again, you know, it's, it, we, we also, you know, we all have a team that we support, but it's no fun, you know, watching it at home in your pajamas. Um, uh, so, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I would have to, you know, it's it's definitely a testament to, to, um, to, to the venue. And, and and funny enough, we're also a New York City FC uh, pub partner. So, uh, you know, on those match days when, uh, you know, we have Liverpool playing and then NYCFC playing later that afternoon, we do have some fans that you know take their red shirts off and put their blue shirts, you know, on for for the NYCFC away game. So. It's, uh, it's, it's great to see that, uh, you know, we, we basically have venues that, that support and, and, and nurture that, that, that fan base. Sure. Um, Michael touched on a point there. We were going we to uh, talk about it later, but since he's mentioned it, um, and you may be a good one to speak on it, Andrew, uh, we want to kind of know, like, is it possible to really support a team back home and a team, a local club here? Is it, you know, is it a fair thing to say that I'm New York and I'm also Liverpool? Uh, you're sort of in a more comfortable position than most because you get Manchester City and NYCFC. The, the bridge was natural for you. Um, how do you look at that kind of dynamic? Uh, uh, Manchester City still come first for me because it's such a longer, deep connection, it's deep in my family. Uh, you watch and love a team that is so bad for so long. You know, we, you know, our probably other than Blue Moon, our most famous song that we sing is uh, "We're Not." Is you know, we sing "We're Not Really Here" and we sing "We Never Went at Home and We Never Went Away." You know, we've always had that sense of humor. I think that's just builds that bond. And you know, New York City is having its struggles too. Um, no, much more this year, but that first year was a lot like watching Manchester City in the '90s. Um, so I uh, got my, you know, made me feel connected. Um, in terms of our general group membership, I mean, so uh, I, support, I support New York City FC. I love the team. I've really come come to enjoy being a season ticket holder, and um, I'm a member of uh, an unofficial supporters group called Hearts Folk. Uh, we hold down session 238. Um, there's not, uh, you know, so there's a few members uh, of the New York Sky Blues who are regulars at the Mad Hatter who are members of Hearts Folk or, or season ticket holders, but I wouldn't say the 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 uh, overlap is actually, as far as I understand, a lot less than you'd think, yeah, at least yeah. among season ticket holders. I mean, especially a lot of the older English guys have not come around to the idea that VMLS is worth watching yet. Sure. Um, and that's going to be hard to break down. It's, it's being broken down all the time, you know. Uh, but in terms of you know, season ticket holder, supporters group members, the hardcore support for New York City, I mean, it's growing, but it's gonna, there's a lot of skepticism. Yeah, I feel like that's a question that's maybe been perplexing MLS executives for a long time is, you know, they see all these, they see soccer exploding and they see so many people watching the EPL and it's just, how do we convert those people into local Major League supporter fans? Um, do you guys have any idea? I mean, it's, it's probably a little bit, you know, with, with Bayern Munich and Liverpool, it's so much rooted. Do you kind of see what would it take to, you know, convert a Liverpool fan into also going to NYCFC games? I mean, for, for, for me, it's, it's definitely a, a chicken and egg type, you know, situation, where, you know, with, with respect to, to, to the, the mass appeal and, and, and the, you know, the, the marketing that goes behind it. It's, uh, it's, it's tough. I mean, you know, I, I always make the joke that you're never going to see, you know, Jay-Z and Beyonce at, you know, a Red Bull Arena, you know, watching a game or, or, or at Yankee Stadium, for that matter, watching NYCFC. And, and even though that's, you know, a very fickle and shallow, uh, you know, uh, uh, an analogy there, it's, it, it, you know, you, you do have to kind of crack that, you know, crack that nut and get into, um, you know, just get into popular culture, you know, to, to, to really crack it. And, and one thing that I, that I find about the MLS is that it's, it's just too clean. You know what I mean? There, there, there's, 
very little controversy. You, you never hear, you know, like, you know, these uh, just like stories of, of uh, it just doesn't make the press. And sometimes, you know, bad press is good press. Yeah. And, 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 you know, we, you know, all of us are on social media and, you know, we're more likely to retweet, uh, you know, uh, Wayne Rooney, uh, you know, drink driving, you know, versus him, you know, donating X amount of money to a children's hospital or whatever. And that's just the way it is. So um, I, I, I personally think that MLS needs to kind of, you know, just say, you know, whatever happens, happens. And let's, you know, if some controversy hits, hits, then that's actually good for, good for the brand. You know, Orlando, people, Orlando City got the ball rolling for you there the other yeah. day. but <laughs> So they may be off the side. Uh, Mateus, what do you think it would take to get you know, more kind of European fans engaged and South American fans engaged in Major League Soccer here? Uh, I really think that it's not the European or South American fans that you need to engage for Major League Soccer. I think it's the kids that don't know what sport they want to play. And the kids today that are interested in soccer and will start playing soccer are the Major League fans in a decade and I think you need a long-term approach you will get some European and South American soccer fans that watch the MLS most of the members in the fan club do uh, we go to uh, uh, Yankee Stadium to watch uh, Schweinsteiger play with Chicago Fire because he used to play for Bayern um, and but that's more short-term yeah. that's more short-term mm -hmm. yeah you can get all the older players from Europe to play in the, in the major league because you want to build your own star players um, that kids today will follow. Um, so I think and the United States has made great progress in, in their soccer infrastructure. Um, but the soccer fan that the MLS needs tomorrow is you know, eight, nine, ten years old today. And those are the kids that need to be enticed to uh, start playing uh, uh, soccer instead of uh, American football or baseball. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, with the amount of uh, soccer fields that has sprung up in New York City, the clubs, the youth development, uh, when I go play soccer on Saturday or Sunday on Reynolds Island, I see soccer teams in the morning, kids running around, and, and that's the best that's the best support that the MLS uh, can build for the future. I suppose it does kind of tie in somewhat to what Michael was saying that you know there needs to be sort of a pop culture aspect to it too. Like kids need to want to look up to Great. soccer players and want to become megastars like them. Um, Rox, do you have any thoughts on that? Because since you're already on home turf, um, I agree with him largely. Uh, I think we should continue to focus on youth. I think if you um, make it a part of the culture here from the ground up it'll uh, work out better in the long term. Um, I think the league itself has just done great over its short life to um, grow the game here in the United States. Um, obviously, the World Cup has helped that. And I think from, from the MLS perspective, I think it would be helpful if they continue to focus on keeping the game modern. Um, you know, these clubs have such long histories mm -hmm. that, you know, people are so attached to that history. Well, this league is, it has a very short one. So you have more space to create something new, something different, something not based in a tradition that you just don't have and you may not ever have. Um, continue to focus on that and push forward. And I think people will become more engaged over time. It, it just takes time. There's no thing that's gonna turn it into, you know, the, the biggest sport tomorrow. So your, your next role, year even. It, it's going to take 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Your I'm role within your supporters group, I know you guys work on some programs outside of the stadium. You guys kind of have some extracurricular programs that you work on. Um, do you guys do that more for kind of future development or for membership development or for community development? For, for both. I mean, I think one of the roles of a supporter group is to grow the profile of your club. Um, not that they can't do that on their own, but it, it's just the nature of what you do. If you're out in your jersey, you're supporting your club, you're representing your club, and someone who may be unaware may see your jersey, like the style, like the color, and say, hey, what's that? And it's happened to me many a time. You know, even just coming here today, I was coming from work, I, I was changing my shirt outside of my car, and I see people looking like, oh, what's he doing? Um, just here, the lady at the hot dog cart was like, oh, do you work here? Are you, are you with the team? Or, 
So it's little things like that over time. It just builds and builds. Um, the, the, this club has been fantastic with marketing. This space um, adds all around the city on trains, buildings, phone booths, whatever. All of those things matter. So everything that we do as a supporters group is to promote ourselves first and foremost, but the bigger we are, the more active we can be in our community, and that raises the profile of everybody involved. Um, Rox is in a you know a, a good position because you know he's in his home base, and when they want to work with the team, they can do so with events like this. Uh, for you guys, do you have to really go out of your way to kind of build a connection between your supporters club and the team back home? Do you do you take steps to try and build that bridge? Uh, for for us, luckily. Uh, it's been gotten better since uh, FC Bayern opened their U.S. office in 2014, and uh, the team comes on the American tour every two years. Uh, they were here 2014, 2016, uh, so uh, every even-numbered year they come to the United States. They played in the International Champions Cup uh, last year. Uh, in the uh, odd-numbered years, they go uh, to Asia. Unfortunately, in the even-numbered years, Germany makes it far in the Euro or World Cup, and most of the uh, German national players are Bayern players, so we don't get to see all the, all the uh, top players, but we're fine with that because people don't really get to uh, go to Germany often, but uh, every year or every second year, we'll organize a trip uh, next year uh, with the help of the Bayern fan, fan club uh, Long Island, um, and uh, sometimes players uh, uh, come here uh, during a break. There are uh, ambassadors, FC Bayern Munich ambassadors, that uh, visit the States because it's such a big market. Uh, so luckily we have that connection uh, with the FC Bayern office that help us out uh, big time. Okay. <coughs> yeah, um, for, for us it's a, it's a bit different because uh, um, my uh, being the co-founder of the New York Hopites, uh, my my, my better half, I'd say, uh, Dwayne is, is, is from Liverpool. His, um, his uncle is Howard Gale, who was the first black player to ever play for Liverpool. And uh, he also founded the, uh, the former players union uh, for Liverpool players. So our connection is more with the players and the former players uh, that have played with Liverpool than the actual club itself. Um, because we are an unofficial supporters club. So with that said, um, you know our, our efforts. It's it's, it's strange because it's it, it, they they are like family to us, and and uh, and when they come over, they come over to our bars, and it's not you know more often than not we don't do the whole dog and pony show, whole Q and A with them. It's like it's like your uncle's at the bar and he's Have there for four hours, and hey, you know <laughs> Jamie Carragher's here, you know, or Roy Evans, or whoever it may be, just, you know, come over, meet and greet, and, it, and it's, it's a very family-type atmosphere um, that, that, that really just happened organically through our relationships with them. So, uh, you know, we're very fortunate that, that we have that, and, um, and I mean, the, the only thing that I could say is that our, our fan base is, you know, incredibly uh, happy and, and just elated to have that type of relationship with, with sure. the players yeah with us it's really interesting because the hatter became our bar in 2007 um we had a few you know with longtime members who you know back when if anybody remembers when nevada smith was still a dive bar you know they're watching it on one tv on probably a not terribly legal substantive sports stream um and then the hatter came along and became our home um before you know then before anybody ever thought of a chic or money or CFG or anything the idea of Manchester City being globally branded and coming over here was hilarious you know yeah. but um, every single time you need to be here for visit whatever Gary Cook the old CEO made himself a regular at the Hatter we've had also uh, we had play, players even Dennis Tewart popped in he's a legendary city player from the 70s just said nothing related to the club or anything but he just said hey I'm in town I've heard about the Mad Hatter can I you know come hang out talk to you guys for a little while um, it's really taken on its own reputation around the, around the world as you know because I think if I'm not wrong in saying I think that we were the first American Manchester City pub um, and everybody knows about it you know people Say, oh, you, you, New York, I'm um, city sport, have to come to Mad Hatter. You know, we have to don't ha really have to do a lot of our own outreach because sure. 
the club of Future Death so much. Um, you know, we've raised since in the past 10 years, we've raised more than $45,000 for city and the community. Um, and most recently this past year for uh, ALS research, one of our, again, one of our longest time members uh, has been struggling with that as well as a um, relative of our favorite bartender. Uh, so we raised, what, 11,000 some odd dollars last year? 12. Um, so all these things that we do have just made, the Hatter is kind of a living force of its own. Um, and now, now the club does have this amazing global reach. Uh, you know, last year uh, when they were here on tour, uh, Alexander Kolarov and Ed and Jekko, neither of them are with us anymore, but they came in, they did a QA. and a um, Some of us got to go okay. behind the scenes at Yankee Stadium and out on the pitch. We met Joe Hart and Vincent Company and David Silva, and uh, all of us were a little too starstruck to remember to take a picture. Um, like, <laughs> it's on video. Yeah, yeah, it's on video. Um, but so, yeah, it's... Uh, it's, yeah, it's a life. It has a life of its own, and it's really been an amazing thing to come into. Um, that's great. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions in just a second. I just wanted to uh, fi finish off real quick, pick their heads. Um, you mentioned Satanta Sports, you know, yeah. the back in the day, the, the dark old ages. Um, I just like to get. I mean, I guess it, you know, Bundesliga and Major League Soccer are kind of in a good place at the moment, but. Uh, where do you guys feel we are at the moment in terms of the role that streaming is playing in live games? Is it, is it a step forward or is it becoming a step backwards now, the role that streaming is playing in you know, weekly games and the accessibility to games? Um, you know, I am still a little unnerved by the fact that I can see every single Manchester City game because it used, was not that way until the NBC deal, really. Um, you have to get really lucky or again, you know, go dive into the dark parts of the internet for some stream in a language you don't recognize. Um, so the accessibility and being able to see every game is amazing and I love it. Um, at the same time, you know, NBC's new match pass thing is kind of worrying and I'm worried they're kind of should get, shoot themselves in the foot with it because they're trying to monetize something that's been freely available to everybody as, you know, as like a cable subscription and all that stuff for a long time. Uh, so. Probably us and our clubs are big enough where we probably don't have to worry about it too much, but if you're a Bournemouth or a Burnley or a Swansea supporter or something like that, you're being asked to fork over $50 because your club isn't deemed to be big enough. Sure. Um, so yeah, so there is a dark aspect to it as well. Um, and still, I don't know if this is going to change, but you know, we still, the only things we really miss every year are like early round league and FA Cup games. A lot of times, you know, just don't, U.S. broadcasts just don't pick them up. Sure. So the accessibility is great, but it has to stay at a level where everybody can continue to access it because the NBC deal has been amazing for the growth of the sport in this country. Yeah. Just the sheer accessibility of it. But if they start trying to get a little greedy and dip their hands further and further in, then I think it's going to turn people off. Mike, is it two step forward, one step back? Um, not, not necessarily. Obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit biased because uh, I manage a bar. So... Um, yeah, I want people to come to the bar, and if you can't get it at home, great. That means that you know more people are going to come to the bar. And but to that point, it also adds to uh, you know getting more members and having you know having a just you know a, a much much better experience because there's more people at the bar uh, watching it. Um, so I, I, I do uh, I do agree with you, but I, I do disagree with you with respect to that. Um, the accessibility is amazing. Um, we recently took on um, Atletico Bilbao uh, at, at Carragher's, uh, and uh, with them it's a bit of a challenge because you know they they, they come on on uh, you know last game I think was like on BN4 or something like yeah, that. So, yeah. so you know we, we had to you know we, we had to get um, you know purchase an app and, and have that. But but that that's okay. I mean you know. It, it, uh, at the end of the day, you know the, the the name of the game is is really supporting the team that you you know that you want to watch, and if you have to pay a little bit extra for it, then hey, if if you're willing to wake up at seven seven o'clock in the morning and watch, you, you could pay the extra you know twenty bucks or whatever it is. So um, I, I get it from a business standpoint. I think it's it's gone. I'd say four steps ahead to be honest with you, because those Satanta days and those Fox days. Um, they, they were pretty, pretty bad. And yeah, uh, yeah and, I, and I remember watching, you know, satellite streams of Liverpool, uh, you know, in Russian. So, so yeah, we've, we've come a long way, baby. Yeah, it's good. So it seems to be a matter of perspective. It's uh, some bars are looking at it as a competitive advantage. 
to the others who are just kind of too lazy to learn streaming. Uh, Matthias, any thoughts? Yes, I, uh, we're social animals. We like to do things together. It's more fun to watch uh, a soccer match with your friends and then shoot the whether it was a penalty or not, and whether Lewandowski should score three goals instead of two, um, or whether Neuer should play in midfield and somebody else should play goalkeeper. Um, so, you know, that, that's really the driver of a supporters club, that we do things together because we're a social club and we do things together outside watching uh, uh, soccer matches. Um, but I have noticed soccer fatigue over the last few years, and it's not because the of the amount of uh, matches that are available streaming or on TV, it is because of the amount of matches that are being played. The tournaments, the Confederations Cup, the Euro, the expanded roster, the qualifications for the Champions League, for the Europa League, there's just too many matches. The players are getting tired, they're getting injured early in the season. And uh, that, that's one thing that I've noticed. So the, it's really the amount of matches that are being played. Soccer is such a big business. It's such a big money maker for a lot of corporations. You've seen this with the recent transfer period. Uh, so that's one thing that will become a problem. Uh, I don't have a solution for it. Um, but we're social animals. We like watching matches together. So whether they're available streaming more or not really doesn't affect us. Um, what type of streaming are we talking about specifically? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you, you maybe have to <laughs> encounter it once or twice in a season. But. Uh, so yeah, we don't do a, a ton of streaming. We watch some preseason stuff over streaming. Um, I use streaming mostly for trying to watch my team in J-League, since that's so obscure and my team is really obscure. It's a local team. I used to live in Japan. So watching those games, I have to find streams online where I can. Otherwise, I have zero shot of seeing them play. Um, so I think streaming is great. Um, people want to watch the game. And sometimes, if you're on the other side of the world from something that you want to watch, streaming is the only way. That's a good thing. I also think that it's, again, it's modern. And if you are not modern, then you eventually become irrelevant. So streaming is a huge help for all sports everywhere. Sure, good point. Um, we'd like to open it up onto the floor for any questions. Um, yeah, how do you? Uh, yeah, how do you want to structure? <laughs> um, so yeah, my name is Calder. Uh, I'm a huge New York City fan been a season ticket holder since the beginning. I'm also a huge Manchester United fan. Um, I know. But, uh, I mean, uh, for me, I guess it kind of, my question kind of goes back to the youth and demographics for me. Um, I just graduated from college, and it was nice. I was in a frat, but we were, like, huge soccer guys, so we would watch games together, talk about the sport. Um, I was probably, like, the only MLS fan for like most of my college and stuff. But I was wondering for you guys, um, this is something I'd really like to get into, you know, come to the supporters groups, watch games at the bars. But um, like, what do you think the key is? Or like, what are, do you kind of, like I'm 22, so do you, you know, what are your demographics like, I guess? You know, do you mostly have like 30 and above fans that come or younger? Does it, you know, kind of, how have you seen like your supporters groups grown? And I guess the demographics and, um, you know, maybe, uh, or if there are any ways that you're just trying to do that with like social media or maybe just, you know, other stuff outside of watching games like FIFA tournaments or something like that. Sure, you got this. Anyone want to take this first? I think I'd be the most relevant. Sure. <laughs> Since he's a Manchester United fan. Uh, so for the third rail specifically, um, our demo is very, very wide. We have 14 year old members that come to the bar and watch with us. We have 60-year-old members that come to the bar and watch with us. Uh, one of the uh, key draws for our specific group is that we're very much inclusive. So we are one of the few, maybe the only in the league that has a youth group. They call it the light rail. Um, they're for like under 14 members. Um, we haven't fully fleshed out how we're going to get them involved in the whole game day experience, but we do events for them. Um, we actually have an event coming up this Sunday 
that light rail kids are invited to and they'll be able to play down on the mini pitch. So things like that. Um, it just depends on what style you're looking for. Um, again, our group is inclusive. That's why we get such a wide range. But in general, most supporters groups are probably early 20s to mid 30s. Um, it's very much male focused. Um, but we do have a lot of women as well. Then there are women specific supporters groups. Um, yeah, that's kind of the, the end of it. As far as how do you get involved, it's just a matter of finding what interests you. Um, check out websites, uh, check out, the, the team has a page for supporters, yes? yes. Yeah, um, you can check that out. Our website is thirdrail.nyc. I also have some uh, materials here that you can take if you want. Um, but yeah, find what you like, what interests you, go to games, sit in the supporters section, uh, watch parties for away games, just go to places, talk to people, see what you like, and then get involved from there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we we have eight month olds and eighty year olds. It's uh, you know it's 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 pretty wide, but um, I'd say yeah, it's definitely more more male uh, dominated. You know, especially with the uh, with the tourists. The you know the 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 ladies stay in the hotel sleeping, and the guys will come out have uh, you know have cold uh, cold cold pints, and watch watch the matches. But um, you know, a funny story that I want to share. Um, that, that kind of made me, made, me, made me think of this. Uh, when we first uh, opened up the boot room, which is uh, the, uh, uh, the one on 17 John Street, uh, the Irish American, we basically from one day to the next, it was an existing bar. We you know, painted the walls red, put a memorabilia up, and, and um, it's a very unique neighborhood that, down there. It's, you, know, you still have uh, you know, guys rebuilding after 9-11, your, you know, your, your union guys, your you know, blue collar guys, but also you have your your suits, you know, brokers by Wall Street and stuff that come in, call that, you know, call that bar their local. I remember being there for a, for, for a midweek <coughs> game and the guys were like, you know, what the hell is all this soccer? Like, you know what I mean? And, and sorry, <laughs> they're like, you know, what, what is this? And, uh, you know, I got to talk to them and made friends with them on Facebook. Now, you know, three and a half years on, I see their kids are being born with Liverpool onesies on. You know what I mean? They're 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 you know products of their environment. So uh, I think you know to to his point, yeah, you you got to see what you know what, you know what people you want to be around. You know what I mean? I, all, all the Manchester United fans that I that I know aren't the greatest people, but you know that's that's. Uh, <laughs> 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 Amen. You know, I mean, you, you pick your team, you pick your team. I, I'm not saying you're going to switch, but, but yeah, you definitely want to be in an environment that you know that, that that's that's positive, and you know, with respect to the kids, that's that you know, it's very important. You you want to have an environment that that is is not only uh, you know safe but also encouraging because, uh, you know, it, those you know those experiences resonate with the kids. You know, and it's like it's like wow, you know, I'm here with you know 200 fans in New York City. You know, uh, you know, singing my, my lungs out. That you know, that creates a fan for life. Yeah. So the Hatter is interesting again because I think I think if I remember rightly, it's been a while since I've been in the Irish American, but I think we're the smallest decided pub, the Hatter. Um, and especially, you know, you walk in that front door and you know, it's just us. You know, we pack we pack it out almost every single game, and we're loud, we're rowdy, we're going. Um, so we're talking talking about this with uh, Michael earlier, wherever he went, um, about how you know, especially with City, there's a lot of people who just learned about the club with uh, since the since the takeover, since Sergio, since Sergio Aguero's winner, um, since all of that, um, and you know, if you come to us, I mean, we're a lot of us have been there for way before, it's way before the buyout, so we're in, we're kind of have our own in-group, our own culture about it that can be really in, in, uh, intimidating for some newcomers. Uh, so, but we tried really hard, you know, because a lot of people there, especially, again, some of the older uh, English guys who have been there, been at it for a, for a long time and are still kind of wrapped up in the culture of Main Road, for, for instance, um, can be kind of disdainful of the younger people, the newer people coming into it who don't know as much, who didn't go through the hard times, et cetera, et cetera. But we're trying really hard, you know, we'll put an arm around them and say, come on, come on in, this is how it goes, here's your pint, just, nope, just keep going, keep going, yep, you, 
<laughs> you know, I'm not saying we're forcing people to drink. That would be wrong. Um, but, uh, you know, so and especially the other thing about our group of the Hatter is compared to, especially compared to the groups I was, you know, around in Chicago when I started, when I helped start the city sports group there, we're a lot more diverse, I think, than a lot of, uh, I mean, it's, it's a function of New York City for one, but I guess our group is from all walks of life, all demographics, and it's a really awesome mix of people with a huge diversity of experience. Um, so, and you know, again, you know, the Hatter fits in maybe 250 at max, and it's, you know, somebody from everybody there, and it's a really cool thing in that tiny, tiny space. There are any other questions from anybody? Yeah? Hi, um, thanks for doing this. Uh, I was just kind of curious what, like, what's the most onerous uh, part of, you know, running a supporters club, and maybe what's the most rewarding part as well? Sure. Let's take it. <laughs> <laughs> His question is uh, basically what's the most difficult part about running a supporters group and what are the benefits, the greatest benefits? Sure. It's time consuming. Um, you have to get up early for the matches. Uh, since I founded the fan club, I had to be there for every single game and uh, it was easy for me uh, because I just love my club. Uh, but it's a time commitment and uh, since Bayern makes it far in every uh, competition, there's a lot of matches that I had to be at the bar. Uh, in the Bundesliga, in the, in the German Cup, then in the Champions League. Um, but it's, uh, it's certainly worth it. So it's, it's a big time commitment and the friendships uh, that I've made through uh, uh, being part of the club for five years uh, and the memories uh, of uh, winning the Champions League and winning the triple and losing in the semifinals three years in a row with Pep Guardiola um, and then having uh, <laughs> having had to console uh, having had to console members that were crying because when you lose with your team you know the world the world ends uh, but just just uh, it's just a great uh, human experience uh, for me definitely uh, I, I echo your sentiments I mean um, uh, an ex-wife later um, <laughs> I've <laughs> You know, I remember she used to tell me, she's like, you know, you're getting up early. She's like, they don't freaking pay your bills. I'm like, well, they do now. So uh, <laughs> um, it, it was obviously, it was a, a, a passion project. Um, you know, it was something that, that, you know, when we started it back in 2008, we did it out of just, just pure love. And, and like you said, getting the people that, 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 that you really want to be around and, and, and loved, you know, together. And... Yeah, it's you know it's time consuming, but the benefits far outweigh it. You know, especially on a match day when you have you know so many different you know cultures and, and colors and religions and, and everything, and, and that one common denominator that you know we're all singing the same song, albeit in different accents. We're we're, we're still we're still one. And um, I'd say the biggest you know one of the biggest benefits is is when we do fundraisers. To be honest with you. You know, we've done so many fundraisers for you know not only local charities but charities back back in Liverpool. Um, that um, that you know, I, it gives me goosebumps just just to know how much money we've been able to raise for for these foundations that that you know that, that need the money and and it really it binds everybody together. You know, everything from uh, you know raffles to bake sales. It it gets everybody involved in a way where um, you know, with all due respect to to your to your respective clubs, you're, you're official, and, and you have, uh, you know, you have your politics, and you have your, uh, y you know, your ranks and stuff. You know, with, with us, it's it was it's never been, uh, you know, you're the president, you're the you're whatever, you're the vice president. It's it's always like everybody pulls their weight, and everybody does what they want, what 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 they feel is in the best interest of of the supporters club. Yeah, as you say, I'd say. The most difficult and most rewarding thing for us is, again, uh, fundraising, because we do a 50-50 raffle at halftime of every game where you know, half, half the total take uh, goes to city and community or ALS research, 
and uh, the other half goes to whoever wins the raffle. So um, you know, we're handling, especially I don't, I don't, I'm not on this side so much, but uh, say Andre over here, you know, at halftime you're running through a sea of people counting cash, keeping track of things, giving out raffle tickets, just logistically it's a challenge. Um, and it's going to be about to get more interesting because I'm working right now uh, with our president to uh, take to make us a full official nonprofit. Um, so going through the paperwork of that in New York State and the federal government and all that is an absolute joy for you know, if anybody's <laughs> ever done it. Um, 501c3. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but again, you know. That all of that money that's going to people that we know, you know, the that money, the city community, the the pitch at um, the public school in Harlem, the forget the number right now, you know, that's part part of our fundraising. That's we uh, at Hearts of Oak, uh, we do a lot of again, we work pretty closely with South Bronx United too. We've raised a lot of money for them. Um, so again, the logistics of it and keeping track of everything and being responsible with it is, you know, it's a lot of work, um, and especially for. Our president, John, he uh, he comes down for almost every single game from uh, f pretty far up in Connecticut. Uh, so you know, he's doing five-hour round trip every single time he wants to come into the city for a match, uh, more or less. Uh, you know, there's a lot, a lot of dedication, a lot of work, but the payoff and you know, all the people involved with it are amazing. So. Um. Uh, we have to wrap up in a second, but uh, to speak to this, I'd say I work on the business side. I'm often working with bars, so I've helped nurture a lot of supporters club through this process. And I'm sure the guys will agree that the one thing to keep in mind with a supporters group is that it all, all, every supporters group begins with one or two people. Um, that's, what, that's all it takes in the beginning, it's just one or two dedicated people who are willing to constantly show up and constantly make the effort. <coughs> And it's amazing to see, I mean, I remember Mike getting this, getting this started and now they do trips with, you know, they do events with four or five hundred people. It's incredible to see how far it's come in such a short time. Um, I would just say that, you know, the supporters groups play a very important role. They have their part to play in soccer in this country. And certainly in America, they have a significant role to play in the future of soccer in this country. They're a very versatile middleman. So they can Im impact the, the young kids growing up. They can bring them into an environment at a younger age that's a fun environment, really get them to support their team and really make it sort of, you know, you know more of a, a social aspect of things as, as well as just supporting your team. And then as well as that, they can play their role in terms of dictating, you know, what teams do and, you know, how, how supporters are treated and, you know, what, what the amenities and environments are going to be like in stadiums. So, you know, in this country more so than probably anywhere else where I've seen it, I would say that supporters' roles and supporters' groups, they play a very significant role. They're very well organized. Some of them wield a lot of power. So it is something to be taken into consideration at all times. And it's certainly something worth getting involved in if you're a fan. So definitely keep that in mind. Any final words from you guys? Go on, CFC. <laughs> all right, I guess we got to wrap it up. But uh, thank you guys all very much for showing up tonight.